Welcome back to Turning Hard Times to Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm really happy to have with me once again Frank Holmes. Frank is the CEO and Chief Investment Officer of U.S. Global Funds, specializes in natural resources and emerging markets investing, and as Chief Investment Officer of the U.S. Global Group, uh, Frank oversees the, an investment team whose mutual funds um, and ETFs have done very, very well in the last number of years. And uh, So, Frank, it's really good to have you with me again. It's good to be with you, Jay. Yeah, um, Frank, in particular, uh, I want to ask you about an article that you wrote recently, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago or so, titled, You're Probably Underinvested in Gold. Why do you say that? Well, it's interesting. It really is evident when you go to Canada, which is where most of these gold money companies function and and domiciled, and uh, the pension funds institutions, they should be 6% weighted in gold stocks, is 6% of the index there. Mm -hmm. And... um, they might have 1%. So you have a lot of asset allocators in the big banks, and the banks control mostly in their retail uh, investment decisions, and they're way underweighted. Mm-hmm. So if you're using one of the, those um, uh, robo-allocators, et cetera, um, you're, you're extremely underweighted. An asset class that was just done phenomenally well this past year, mm-hmm. and in fact, uh, you know, for the – if you've been long the royalty companies in particular, which you've always been talking about, mm-hmm. and myself, you know, you've done exceptionally well in the past one, three, five, and ten years. So you're saying that Canadians are under under uh, underexposed? Very much so. So that means even in the U.S., it's even more even so. Even worse so. Only even one percent. Yeah. yeah. And only one percent of the S and P 500 is gold related. Uh-huh. And uh, so if 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 you're talking about the average portfolio of theirs, might be one tenth of that. Mm-hmm. So you were only talking about basis points, and and so what I was trying to figure out you you have to have you have to have a three year sequence that all of a sudden it starts to show up by pension funds and institutions uh, the thirty six month of outer performance of gold stocks will all of a sudden have oh we have to take a look at that why does it take that long Frank you know I don't know but it's a good question because I asked it regarding an old model of Sir John Templeton. And uh-huh. that he would fire you as a portfolio manager if you were in the bottom 25% after 36 months. Uh-huh. So uh-huh. you had to always be, you know, you could have a bad year, you could have a bad quarter, but uh, it, it just couldn't afford uh, three years. <laughs> that's 36 I, months. I guess not. So uh-huh. so th- that's sort of the, the model. So what happens is the psychology. It, it's like um, being contrary investing. Um, that you know, buy gold when it's uh, oversold. No, that that, that uh, people predominantly come in and buy once above the 50 day, and when the 50 days above the 200 day, then pension fund big blocks of money feel more safe to go and invest. Mm-hmm. And so there's just tremendous opportunities for the nimble investor like yourself or ourselves mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. that in that space. Yeah, yeah. So I think you said six percent is what there should be um, should be allocated to gold. How do you? If I heard you correctly, how do you come to that number? Well, you just take the TSC index, which uh-huh. most of the, like the S and P, most people, pension funds, etc., are are equally weighted whatever the S and P is. Uh-huh. Um, and so they're they're dramatically underweight in Canada. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, so, and, and gold's done exceptionally well. Yeah. And the more astute guys uh, have not bought where I think the cheapest buy players now. And we had this big acquisition today. Uh, with Detour Lake or the mid tiers. Yes, so they, had, they had great results this past quarter, um, and I think that you're going to see more M and A work in particular there. Yeah, I have to ask you about that. Your thoughts? I, I know that your ETF, your Gold AU, uh, your ETF, a Gold Share ETF, owns Detour. Um, how are you? You must be feeling pretty good about that uh, after you know, today. I think you know something. You know, it really surprised me because I kept questioning the model, but it, it kicked out. Um, uh, got a manana moment here. Um, it, it kicked out uh, uh, Sprott's big investment there when he left and it bought uh, Detour. So yeah, it was like I, a, it's like a 24% premium, um, I think, uh, for Detour, right? Correct. So you must be pretty happy about that today. I'm, v- I'm very happy. You know, that goes off today, and I just saw that we're only off a couple of basis points uh-huh. uh, because, you know, we have a, a good position in it, but we're not getting hurt. And uh, I think that's a big part of these downdrafts, mm-hmm. that you're not owning the stocks that are really getting slammed today. Right. Uh, um, 
and that's what the model does. Um, so I, I was uh, happy with what took place. Do you happen to own? Uh, do you happen to own Kirkland and in, in your two uh, gold mutual funds, gold gold share mutual um, funds? You know, I, we do. Over, I think over there they own Kirkland Lake, and that's what surprised me because Kirkland Lake had uh, attractive free cash flow yield still, and that's part mm-hmm. of one of my key factors. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so what this does in this acquisition, when I've been reaching out to analysts, is actually it, it's going to not be attracted to the quants. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you why. Uh, the biggest buyers of these gold stocks trading in and out, creating liquidity, are quant funds. Mm-hmm. And quant funds don't look at the metrics that the average uh, salesman or, or trader or research analyst uh, is saying, this is cheap on an NAV. This is cheap. They don't buy that. Ah. They, they buy the per share change in key factors, such as when we combine those companies, will the revenue per share rise without any change in production. On, when the existing production, will that revenue per share rise and will the cash flow per share rise? And if it doesn't, they're not going to own the new entity. Mm-hmm. Well, looking at, so, it from, looking at it from a different perspective, though, I'd, from a longer-term perspective, is it a good move for Kirkland or not? Well, I, I think if Eric Sprott was there, it probably wouldn't have happened. Uh, well, why is that? Because Eric made a fortune in a bear market in gold yeah. Uh, by buying high grade gold, all he bought was high grade, high grade, and he mm-hmm. noticed that all of his lumps and pain in the last downdraft was having all these low grade operations. Right. And so, yes, they give you optionality on an upside, mm-hmm. but really, the safest way you can you can make money in a bear market in gold stocks mm-hmm. by staying focused on high grade. Yeah. And that's what he did, yeah. and he made himself eight hundred million dollars. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's true. I mean, obviously, Kirkland's um, average grade uh, production overall is going to go down with this. I would, I would guess, because it's a pretty low grade situation compared to uh, what they have over there in Australia. Um, so you, you mentioned a moment ago that um, you know the the royalty companies, and of course, one of your favorites, if not your favorite one, uh, would be what? That's um, that's uh, Franco Nevada. And I think uh, you had noted somewhere I saw in, in the in, on your website, and I should mention to our listeners, it's usfunds.com. Go there for a lot of great content that Frank writes, and he and his team. You put out an awful lot of material every week, Frank, and I thank you for that. It's it's very very worthwhile. I uh, just want my listeners to know that that they should go there and read your very kind. Thank you. Your, your insights are, are are very valuable. Uh, but I I saw that you had uh, compared Franco Nevada's. Performance to Warren Buffett's quite a, quite a bit better, I guess, hasn't it been over the last number of years? Unbelievable. You know, when it was public in Canada, I'm so lucky that I was got to meet these guys when I was a young man because I took it public. It was my first public uh, IPO. Uh-huh. I left research to become a corporate banker, and um, and during that '84 to the stretch of uh, 2000, when before it merged with Newmont, it outperformed Berkshire then too, and then. And then when it got spun out again in 2008, you know, it's far outperformed Berkshire Hathaway and it's outperformed the other gold stocks. Um, and, and it's simple, you know, you have 30 employees that cost a million bucks a month, uh, all the GNA, mm-hmm. and they're going to you know, do 600 million in revenue. So uh, mm-hmm. their gross margins are, are quite, quite high and their net margins are unprecedented. Mm-hmm. I think the industry as a whole has a 17% margin. Uh, gross profit margin, hmm. and uh, they're they're forty eight percent. Wow! Well, no wonder they get higher multiples, then, don't they? I mean, they really yep. it, it sells. Um, you know, I'm looking at your ETF. You have a, a lot of really interesting things. Some of which I'm familiar with. Um, North American Palladium is there. I see you must have done very well with that one over the last year or two. Well, it's been a big win, and you know, when I was at the Denver Gold Show, I came back and I said, uh, you know, my number one stock from that was 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 the company. Uh-huh. I said, oh, why would you say that? Because Brookfield owns it and they want to sell. Mm-hmm. I said, yeah, because that's not their expertise. They're not gold experts. They just turn the company around. Mm-hmm. And But if you if you look at their free cash flow and their profit margin, Unbelievable. I, you, you've got to get a South African that's going to buy it and that's what happened. You know, mm-hmm. One month later, uh, in came the South Africans mm-hmm. uh, to buy it. Mm-hmm. And so, it was uh, a great pick. You know, my other... The other one that's doing really well is is uh, uh, is. I'm just trying to think of 
of these these stock, but it's not in that ETF. Mm-hmm. Is is the uh, Grand Columbia Gold Notes? Oh, okay. I don't know that story. Yeah. Piece of the, I, I own 5% of my funds, my mutual funds, not in my ETF, and they pay monthly. Mm-hmm. And they pay an eight and a quarter coupon. They're listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange. They pay every month, and every quarter they buy back 6%, they redeem 6%, hmm. and and anything above 1250 they pay you more. So gold runs to 1600 uh, they pay you 13%. Wow. Because you get a bonus. Huh. And but where can you get a play on gold? It's just like gold money for mm-hmm. me. It's just uh, and it's all collateralized against the gold operations. So that's one of those you know stocks that uh, those and their stock has been up five hundred percent in the past three years. What is so this? it's done? Uh, GCM. It's called G- GCM. GCM. That's the symbol. Yeah, that's Did a symbol. Trades and in the U.S. I agree or? once again. Trades in Toronto uh-huh. um, and trades over the counter in the U.S., mm-hmm. but it's high grade. It's uh-huh. very high grade, oh. and um, and management has some issues that they had to resolve a couple of years back, and they have. Huh. And Eric just bought five um, percent of them. Oh, did he? Okay. Yeah. So he's a. So, uh, well, it's very interesting. There's a lot of things going on now in in, in the resource uh, in the gold sector and the. Uh, gold and silver, precious metal sector, no doubt about it. But Frank, I'd like to ask you then: you you have uh, have always been known for you, you you love gold, but you've always been very balanced in your approach, and you've not been a, a nutty gold bug by any means. You've really sort of, I mean, your emerging European fund, you have the All American Equity Fund, um, Global Resources, which is more to do with, uh, I guess, energy and and materials, uh, the China Regional Fund. So you have under your umbrella. A lot of different ways and different places that investors can keep balanced, and you have a policy of, of rebalancing. I believe at the beginning of every year, is that you still doing that? Yeah, I think the more active you are, you do it once a quarter. Otherwise, you you do it once a year. Yeah, and uh, so what would you suggest now in terms? I mean, you have two mutual funds, two gold mutual funds, the gold precious metals funds and world precious metals funds. What? What's the difference between those two? One is a larger cap, I guess, and one's a smaller, more exploration right. uh, orientation. And, and, and world, world historically has always outperformed, but for the past couple of years, it's been a real dud because it has all these juniors you and I love. Yeah, and they haven't and, and, kept you know, up. We, no, there, there's just no bid on them uh, unless they get taken over, uh, and that's just uh, the problem. We've got great value stocks, and Ralph Aldis, the director of research, uh, there always sees those funds, and he has – Two geology degrees, a master in economics, a CFA, <laughs> and 40 years of experience. He just came back from Ivanhoe Mines operations in the Congo. Uh-huh. Um, he's, uh, you know, he's he's astute as a walk in the ground. At the same time, right, doing financial models. Mm-hmm. So uh, he, he, it's sort of very frustrating because there's just no interest yeah. in that junior space. Mm-hmm. Do you think that a change? No. You don't think it would change? I think, no, I think you're going to have to have commodities a lot higher, Jay. Much, mm-hmm. much, much higher. And that's something that, that's just my opinion now. I went mm-hmm. to Lima Institutional Conference, and, and this thing, that this operative word called ESG, mm-hmm. Environment, Social, Sustainability, uh, Governance, uh, Corporate Governance, it supersedes making money. It supersedes exploring. You you go into these, comp- these countries now, and the local... Uh, poor education system, that's your responsibility if you want to explore in that area. The healthcare, that could be there. So the ESG has become such a barrier that the gold fields are telling me in South Africa, they spend 40 million a year in it now. Wow. And when I went to the Denver Gold Show, all these companies had to present their ESG up front, uh, not their financials. Uh, and, and Ian Telford told me that this is what's happened is that these companies are no longer gold mining companies. They're basically social welfare uh, corporations. Oh. And uh, governments uh, have failed in Latin America and Africa. Yeah. They have basically failed in their in their duties to these communities. And so the, the socialist mindset for like, Europe, this all comes from Europe, yeah. is it's got to be uh, the companies, it's, companies have to do it. The companies have to do it. Oh. And, uh, and if you don't have a strong ESG in London, the head of the Socialist Party, if he gets into power, wants to have you delisted from the company. Delisted. Oh, that's horrible. So, yeah, and, and so what's happened in Europe is the word shareholders' rights have been replaced by stakeholders. Mm-hmm. And a stakeholder can have one dollar or a million dollars. They're, e- they're treated equally. Treated equally, vote. yeah. And, well, and which is ridiculous. So, therefore, 
um, making money and getting a return on capital to reinvest and do things mm -hmm. is not important. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think we're going to have to have you know much higher gold prices, copper prices, to all of a sudden be able to pay for this big ESG burden. Because mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't want to put money into a company they're going to say, okay, you know, 40% is going to go to ESG problems because of the junior explorer. Well, Frank, uh, um, I mean, they're not all these countries alike, though. Are, are you saying just in general that's what's happening? I mean, uh, let's take, uh, for example, Bolivia, a place like that, has been known for its... Uh, for its hostility towards capitalism, towards companies that can in, come in there, Ecuador to an extent, I guess Colombia not as bad now as it once was. Uh, Peru, well, what about Peru? Is that going in that direction as well? Oh, yeah. See, what happened in Peru I mean, a couple of years ago when Lassalle was the president of Newmont, you know, they, the Jesuits uh, priests there got everyone to boycott coming up to Anacocha. Well, why is that? Hmm. Well, in in that country, the royalties paid on that from the lo for the locals of that gold mine go to the federal system to the to Lima. Mm -hmm. Nothing comes back to the community, mm -hmm. so they don't they they can't get any publicity by protesting going down to Lima. So they basically protest by getting cameras and telling people they stop the trucks from coming in. To what extent do you think this movement is going to hurt North America, Canada, and the U.S., for example? I mean, we have a pro a pro mining administration in Washington now, but let's say Elizabeth Warren or somebody like that comes in, what what where well, does that leave the U.S.? Well, I think it's it'll make it very very difficult. I think that the burden uh, and what it'll do is is interesting for me is that. It's going to drive commodity prices higher. Why? Because we have seven and a half billion people, mm -hmm. and they're all having sex, and they're all having babies. Mm -hmm. And so the population is going to continue to grow. Mm -hmm. And now with the Internet and smartphones, et cetera, everyone's wired. Everyone wants the American dream. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that ambitious culture that's now a global phenomenon, it's not going to go away. So you're going to need commodities. You're so just going to need them. So what you're saying, Frank, from an investment point of view, then you you have to be up market. You can't be with the little juniors, that uh, the ones that I focus on primarily. You're going to. I mean, we have some winners for sure in that well, space. Yeah. If you go if you go juniors, you have to really be make sure that your money is going to go into exploration. Mm -hmm. It's not going to get stuck right. with all this. So some of the juniors. Um, that are in Peru mm -hmm. have social problems, mm -hmm. um, community problems. Yeah. And uh, Mary Catusa was telling me that that, that there's the Socialist Party in British Columbia came up with what's called um, the UN DRIP, the acronyms, and basically gives all the rights to the Aboriginal Indians. Uh -huh. So therefore, nothing gets done. So he sold all of his companies that are public companies in, in British Columbia. In BC, uh, yeah. In BC. Yeah. And so just, Justin Trudeau, the premier, is trying to have that implemented throughout the country. Oh, my goodness. So so I'm very bullish for those companies that have safe jurisdictions. Um, and so one of my favorite copper specs is Copper Mountain. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Copper Bank. Sorry, not Copper Bank. Copper Mountain's in B.C. No. Copper so Bank? Copper Bank. So Copper Bank has two big deposits that are in Arizona. Uh -huh. And they own the land, so they have freehold rights. They don't have where the mineral rights are owned by a, by a socialist government that is going to prevent you from developing it. Mm -hmm. And they just need higher copper prices to justify it. So you can buy a stock for, I don't know, it's like a, close to a nickel. Yeah, I know but, the company. And it's worth 12 cents, but when copper goes back to where pre-Trump's battle with the Chinese for the trade war, then all of a sudden it's worth a dollar, this MPV. Mm -hmm. So where can I get that leverage? So I buy stocks like that that I don't have to worry about the time value, like buying futures or options. Right. They expire. Mm -hmm. This copper is not going to melt away in the ground, mm -hmm. and and copper will have a cycle. And just this past week, I've become extremely bullish. I wrote a piece on the weekend about one of my favorite forward-looking uh, indicators. It's called PMI, Purchasing Manufacturers Index. Yes. It's a leading indicator. In America, they call it ISM. Yes. And guess what? We've got a rebound. And it's up now four months in a row in the U.S., the one month above the three months. Uh, Germany's turned from its bottom. All that funny money printing at pr the press in Europe is all of a sudden got a hold. And uh, we've got PMIs rising. A year ago, they were falling. A year ago, the stock market was falling. Now they're turning up. And China's turning up. So what are data points that I've written is that whenever the one month's above the three months, 
uh, six months old copper, uh, iron ores, uh, silver, gold, they're all up. Mm-hmm. And if they stay for three months in a row, one month above three months, then it's an 85% probability the commodities are going to be higher. Uh-huh. So I, I mean, pretty, you know, I remain very constructively bullish on the commodities. Now, Jay, you're going to have to be, you and I are going to be so much more selective uh-huh. on the stocks uh-huh. we pick. Right. Right. Uh, well, well, I would uh, I would think that this bodes well then for your global resource fund, Frank. Possibly. And and by the way, Michael Oliver, who we have on our show every other week, is very bullish too, very constructive on the commodities, the whole commodity complex essentially, softs as well as as well as the metals. Um, so I would think that that might be one that people want to sort of keep an eye on then. Your global resource fund. Those are more senior companies, primarily in that in that fund, Frank. Correct. Mm-hmm. That's correct. I, I have and, uh, to ask you uh, about, I noticed that you have a fund. I wasn't aware that you had until I started preparing for our discussion today. You have a short, you're shorting U.S. Treasuries, I believe. Does that go along with this notion that we're going to have some commodity inflation or, or what? I I'm, I'm, was a little bit surprised. Are you, bull, are you bearish? I mean, are you bearish on, on, uh, on bonds then, on Treasuries? Um, yeah, I'm not. I, I'd rather buy uh, tax-free munis. But I think that's a yeah. much better, mm-hmm. much better play. Yeah. Um, so yes, I, I'm, I'm quite bearish on on uh, on government agency bonds, etc. I mean, where there's all the talk about going negative yields in the U.S. Is that going to happen? Yeah, it's happening with some some series now. You take a look where the CPI number is, the five and three year, two, the two year. Most of foreign currency markets move off of two year relative yields. And this is a negative yield today. Well, yeah, it's negative. So, but what about in um, uh, in nominal terms, not just real terms? Do you see negative real? I mean, negative nominal yields in the U.S. for Treasuries, as in uh, Europe? No, I don't. I don't see that at this stage. Mm-hmm. But I'll tell you something interesting, Jay. Uh, is is the is Powell took the leadership of taking unwinding QE three mm-hmm. one two and three. Yeah. And what what happened with the it caused this global slowdown. There's a shortage of U.S. dollars. Yes. And and so in the past month, they 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 basically done repos of four hundred billion dollars. Yes. That's greater than the dollar value of all mining stocks in the world. So you just think of all the capital expenditures, all the work that's done, and the government can print the press in a month, which which has taken you know years uh, to, to build these these great mines all over the world. So I I think that. Uh, we have to recognize that the the global economies that the G20 finance ministers are functioning like OPEC. It's a cartel. Mm-hmm. Pre 2008, they were all about global trade and economic prosperity. Today, it's about synchronized tax and regulation. Yeah, um, and it's all about dr- using monetary policy to drive economic growth. And so, what you saw from two th- when Obama came into power. Uh, up to uh, four years ago, was this huge rise in regulatory burden, like mm-hmm. costs, like right. a tremendous increase. And they got away with it because they kept printing money to, mm-hmm. to facilitate mm-hmm. um, and, and basically clogging the hearts up, uh, the arteries, with mm-hmm. all these regs. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, uh, power stores taking money out, they never streamlined the regulations. Mm-hmm. That's where all of a sudden you saw this impact of slowing down uh-huh. the world. Yeah. And, and so there's still no commitment out of Europe to streamline regulations. And, you know, I got involved with the high blockchain. And, and I tell you, mining in, in, in Europe, it's just such a, uh, a fiasco. If you think royalty companies do well, you used to see what these governments charge. They, they basically take 24% of your, of your income. Yeah. And, and, and then you say, please, sir, Mr. IRS, can you give me my money back? Yeah. And they think about it. That's, That's why... It's bizarre, and in Switzerland, oh, it's okay. Uh, we'll just take eight <laughs> percent. Imagine a royalty company make if they were able to charge eight percent of well, your revenue from well, production, it'd be unprecedented. Ridiculous. And, and and so they won't streamline those regulations, and they're using uh, cheap monetary money to do it. So what's happening with that? There's two things: is that pre, that funny money that's coming out? The smarter guys like the Swiss. They're buying public companies. Mm-hmm. They own 15% of their own stocks, and they're biggest shareholders of Apple. Mm-hmm. And then you have the Japanese. They're doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. They're the biggest owners of their own stocks. 
but you're seeing Hungary, Ecuador too. I could give you Latin American countries, uh, uh, Poland, uh, Czech. They're all buying gold. Yes, they are. It's and very so interesting. It's both depth and breadth that they're buying gold as an asset class. So I think we're in a secular bull market in gold. We've mm-hmm. had this first, you know, great rally and we have a sell off. Mm-hmm. But I think it just makes it, you know, better for for buying. I don't think it's over. I don't think there's any. What you have to have to change my tune would be a big fiscal discipline of dropping taxes and streamlining regulations. But there's no moral commitment because most of those Europeans are socialists in their policies. Mm-hmm. Biggest danger we have in America mm-hmm. is don't worry about some you know Mexicans coming across the border in Texas. You mm-hmm. better worry about how fast the Beltway embraces new socialist idealism out of uh, Europe. Oh boy, they certainly seem to be uh, certainly seems to be a, a hunger for it among a rising number of younger people, especially, and it's uh, it's very frightening for those of us that have understood uh, that capitalism is a source of, of wealth creation and uh, socialism destroys it. Frank. Um, just, to, just so you're so you're very bullish on gold as we head into 2020. Will we see higher prices at the end of next year than this year for gold? Yeah, I think so. I think you know the DNA of volatility for bullion. It's a non-event to go plus or minus 20 percent any one year. Uh, it's just a non-event, and the gold stocks can go with that plus or minus 40 percent. It's usually two to one, um, and so we staged a great rally. We've come off from it, but we're still up substantially over the past year. So if you look at the one year for bullion, the three year, and you look at the uh, uh, the past uh, ten year in the price of gold, it's done exceptionally well. And the it was in, and the peak was in eleven, mm-hmm. um, but you know they, it, that was uh, uh, because cause, because these government bonds went to my, in the U.S. three hundred basis points mm-hmm. negative, then they went plus two percent. So that's that. It's important for investors to follow real rates of return because we're noticing that the, you look at the weight of all the debt around the world, $17 trillion is now back to uh, $14 trillion is negative. Gold's corrected. So as soon as it starts to go back up to $20 trillion, then all this, their negative yields, then gold turns around and runs to 1900 again. Yeah. That could happen next year, possibly? Yeah. Um, and then what about the equity market in general, Frank? I mean, if they keep pumping money in the system, uh, is there any way that equities will finally peak and head south? Yeah, but I think you have a big difference. You have a president that's unprecedented, that looks in the mirror every morning, checks his hair, and then says, <laughs> what's, the, what's the S&P doing? <laughs> yeah, that seems to be the case. And uh, I, I guess and he knows and he knows that the S&P is forward looking like um, P, uh, PMI is. Mm-hmm. It's a forward looking PMI is looking at commodity demand, whereas the uh, stock market is looking at uh, uh, earnings. And so if the stock market is, is up, that means the economy is going to be doing in six months from now. The GDP is going to be rising. Yeah. And, so, and if he wants to get reelected. He has to have rising GDP. Well, he has to have it. He has to have it for the next twelve months, pretty much. So uh, correct. And uh, so, you're in a presidential election year, um, the um, uh, PMIs have just bottomed here. So it's six months out, I don't think uh, uh, we're going to have it where rates are going to be rising right away. I think we've got a nice, slow, gradual global growth again. All right. Well, we'll have to leave it at that, Frank. We're, we're basically out of time. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. Very valuable insights. And again, my listeners, uh, please, usfunds.com. Go there, too. Frank puts out a lot of information. Frank, you and your, your team there uh, provide a lot of very valuable data. And uh, I want to thank you for sharing a few of your th- very valuable thoughts with us today. And uh, look forward. We should probably have you on more often if, uh, if you're available. So thank you so much, Frank. Well, thank you for the opportunity of sharing my my global travels with people. Absolutely, uh, and quite a few years now of valuable uh, experience in the markets too, Frank. So thank you very much for that. Gold, go, gold. It's G-O-A-U, right, is the symbol? G-O-A-U. Yeah, it's a wonderful gold share ETF. Thank you very much. 